So what I really like about bioenergy crops, dedicated crops, is that I feel like it's a good interface between environmental aspects like climate change and agriculture. And for me, growing up on a farm, I feel like it's a good place where I can find common ground with people that don't necessarily agree with the typical aspects of climate change. All farmers are interested in newer, bigger equipment. And the cool thing with these crops is that we're growing bigger and bigger crops and uh, we're growing them for a purpose of producing fuel and while at the same time sequestering carbon. I'm Andy Van Lukey. I'm the uh, PI for the experiment here at the Sustainable Advanced Bioenergy Research uh, Site called SABER and I've got Madeline with me. Hi, my name is Madeline. I am a second year master's student working for Andy and my project focuses on using the observational data from this site to support our models, our agroecosystem models, so we can use this data here to validate those models and improve them so that way we can extend the knowledge we learn from modeling at this site to other places. So today we're at the Sustainable Advanced Bioeconomy Research Site in, at Iowa State. It's a part of a bioenergy research center that uh, is part of the Department of Energy's research into replacing fossil fuels and, just, and not only the fuel energy that comes from them but the bioproducts and the other derivatives that come from fossil fuels can be replaced by uh, feed, plant feedstocks if you increase their oil content. That's the big question we're looking at. So the uh, Bioenergy Research Center that we're a part of is called CABI, the Center for Advanced Bio Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation. Two of the main feedstocks we're looking at here are biomass sorghum. As you can see, it has a very different life cycle compared to corn and soybeans. It's still growing green. We're gonna harvest it green today and we're gonna deliver it um, to uh, a facility that will compost it. Ideally, along, in the longer term, we would harvest this sorghum, squeeze out the large levels of oil we, we hope to have in them one day, and use those to displace a lot of fossil fuel products that come in that uh, supply chain. So where we're standing right now is among our small plots. Each individual plot flows to a drainage pit. And in that drainage pit, we're monitoring what the flow rate of the water is through that pit. And then we're also taking samples of the water that fell on these plots and moved underground into the pits. That helps us understand how does each different crop remove nitrates from the soil and inhibit that nitrate from being leached or moved by the water. One of the, the best advantages with sorghum compared to other biomass crops like miscanthus is that it's a seeded uh, energy crop and it looks a lot like corn and you manage it quite similarly to corn as well. Um, there's a lot of different types of sorghum there's a uh, biomass sorghum, which we're working on today, which is more of a novel type of sorghum. There's sweet sorghums, and there's forage sorghums, and there's seeded sorghums. There are many different types of sorghum, but the, the variety we're working on and focusing on is a biomass type sorghum, which is bred to basically grow as tall as it can without flowering. Because in sorghum, like other crops, other plants, as soon as it produces a flower, it typically stops growing vegetatively. So this particular type of sorghum has been bred specifically to not flower and continue growing as long as there's sunlight. If we're gonna uh, change the landscape and grow different crops, we wanna make sure that when we do so, we don't alter things in a way we'd, we would not like to have. And we know in Iowa, one of the biggest questions about the way we manage our landscape and our cropping systems is water quality. So the plots that we're looking at today are designed to monitor water quality for our novel feedstock, sorghum, compared to corn and soybeans. So as Madeline mentioned, uh, we're, we're monitoring the water that flows to these fields at kind of a field scale to get a representation of what it would be like if a farmer were to adopt these practices. It's not a great time to see it right now, but some of these plots actually have cover crops as a part of their experimental rotation. So if we were to come back in just about a month or so, we would see there, uh, some early evidence of emerging rye cover crop that is designed to help with this kind of shortened life cycle of sorghum. We're harvesting it before corn, right? So it's designed to help reduce the probability that water would run off with high levels of nitrate in it into our drainage systems and into the waterways. And so to, to, to provide evidence for that, this, the, this experiment is really a key uh, piece of that. I'll start with the ground and we'll move our way up. So first, we have four different soil chambers. And unfortunately, these are not in action right now due to harvest. So these are the collars for the chambers. And the white chambers that actually do the measurements sit on top of these uh, collars and this allows us to get measurements of the gases being emitted from the soil alone. So between these soil flux measurements and the measurements we get from the tower, we can take the difference of those to see how much gas is being emitted from 
the crop itself um, because when we think about um, systems and gas leaving systems well that's a combination of the soil and also the crop so we separate those two measurements so that we know how much is actually coming from the crop itself. It wouldn't be possible without a collaboration between multiple professors and especially two of my colleagues here at Iowa State. So those are Marshall McDaniel in agronomy and Adina Howe. They're both soil scientists who look at how different nutrients going into the soil will affect not only the cycling of those nutrients but the microbes that do that cycling at the same time. So sorghum is pretty different from the surrounding crops so most likely it's going to affect the microbial processes that are going on as well. So here we're standing next to an eddy covariance tower that's doing kind of a real-time monitoring of how the carbon's going in and out of the atmosphere and the soil. I can guarantee that after this machine harvest, harvester goes through, we'll be able to pick up a very different signal. No longer will we be seeing photosynthesis of carbon being drawn down from the atmosphere in this system. We're going to see mostly a loss of res respiration from our system driven by microbes. So my colleagues Marshall and Adina helped me characterize how that's happening, what's driving it, and what that might mean for the broader landscape.